Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you that are here. I uh, hope and pray that that as the day goes on, uh, we'll see more people come in the doors, and we'll. Uh, ask, but for right now, we're just going to worship the Lord. We're just going to go ahead and sing praises to His name. We're going to start off with page number two hundred in our blue book. So we in our blue books this uh, uh, today. You know, I think sometimes we, it, life, life just proves to us it's not perfect. It's, it's, you're going to have great times, you're going to have bad times, no matter how you look at it. It's how you actually maneuver yourself through the bad times, though, that really matter. Uh, it's easy to be excited when you're on the mountaintop, but it's a little, it's a whole different story when it comes to, you know, going through that valley, what we have to do is we have to trust God, that God will take us through. So we're going to sing page number 200 in our blue books, page number 200, Hide Thou Me. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my life in vain. I'm tempted then to murmur and of my lot complain. But when I think of Jesus and all he's done for me, then I cry, O rock of ages, Hide thou me, O rock of ages, hide thou me. No other refuge have I but thee. When life's dark veil, I wander far, far from thee. Then I cry, O rock of ages, hide thou me. Sometimes it seems I dare not Go one step farther on And from my heart all courage Has disappeared and gone But I remember Jesus And all his love for me Then I cry O rock of ages, hide thou me. O rock of ages, hide thou me. No other refuge have I but thee. When life's dark veil I wander Far, far from thee Then I cry, O rock of ages Hide thou me O what a friend is Jesus anchor for my soul tender true and gracious I'm safe in his control my help in time of danger my strong defense is he O thou blessed rock of ages, hide thou me. O rock of ages, hide thou me. 
No other refuge have I but Thee. When life's dark veil I wander far, far from Thee, then I cry, O rock of ages, hide thou me. Brother Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Those of you joining us on the internet, good morning as well. Uh, before I get started, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this glorious day, Lord. We thank you for your day, not promise, Lord. We thank you for everything good and righteous you in our lives. You're the righteous one in our lives, Lord, and we believe in you. And I say in your name, Amen. Amen. Uh, this morning I will be reading out of uh, Psalms 18, chapter 18, verse 46. The Lord lives. And blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Read this verse and it hits me strong, you know, because uh, I know where I was at. I was at my rock bottom, and I, I said to myself, I said, Lord, Lord, take me. Show me the righteous way. Give me a way to walk that I no longer have to walk this um, un unfaithful, ungodly-like life that I was living, um, you know, I, I was at my rock bottom, I had nothing, and, uh, you know, I, I just woke up, and I, I walked out to the bow of my boat, and I just looked up, I said, Lord, I have nothing, show me the righteous way to walk, and, um, you know, and it just uh, occurred to me to get on the phone with one of my family members, and, uh, and he came to pick me up, and um, I, uh, I stayed with him for a few days, and then we found me uh, uh, a place where I could go to rehabilitate myself, to find my wa my walk with the with the Lord. Um, till this day, I've been uh, a new man. I've been sober for almost eight years now and it's uh because i looked up to god and i said lord i need this i need you in my life i need you to change my life around and you know when at the end of the verse it says the lord of my salvation you know i could say that jesus christ is the lord of my salvation because i wouldn't be where i'm at today if it wasn't for me asking the lord to walk with me brother scott I'd like to welcome everybody out to our class this morning. Um, so a couple things before we get started. I know if you've been following us online, you've noticed there's been, we've been, been dealing with some technical difficulties at getting the slides to transition on the screen. They transition the auditorium, but they have trouble when it's being televised. And I know Amanda's been working to try and solve that. Uh, in the meantime, she's taking my PowerPoints and she's adding them to the lesson and reposting it. And so. If you uh, wanted to see, I, I think you might, she might have one up already from the 15th. That was the first lesson. It was the introduction to the book of Romans. And so then there's last week's and then there's this, this week's. And I'm not sure if it's going to work this week or not. So I just want to let you know, bear with us. It was, it, it was a reset or, and an update, I think, that created the problem that we're still trying to work out. So um, anyways, um, and if you would like, pray for us because we really like to get the problem solved so we can go back to making it a little bit easier for her and a little bit more enjoyable for you, hopefully. All right, also the other thing is uh, Brother Green will be bringing the lesson next week as I'm going to be traveling on vacation. Uh, not far, but and not nothing too exciting, just uh, up in the mountains somewhere. But uh, anyways, so if you don't mind, pray for our safe travels. And uh, Brother Greener filling in for me as well. Okay. We're going to take a moment of time here, and we're going to go to the Lord in a word of prayer, asking his blessing on this lesson, and um, and, uh, and and pray for his direction in all things. Gracious Holy Father, we give you thanks for this day and for the blessing of it. We thank you for the life and health that you've given us. We thank you for the great display of love and mercy and grace towards us, Lord. We thank you for saving our souls. 
We thank you for loving us enough to endure uh, the things that Christ endured on the cross for our sakes and for giving Christ to us for the sake of bringing about uh, the sacrifice that was necessary so that we might be forgiven. We pray, Father, that we'll keep that to the forefront of our mind as we live our lives, that you'll help us to uh, see Christ and his sacrifice in our daily walk and strive to put um, uh, him first in our life. We ask that you bless us as we make effort to do so and that you'll teach us by your word here this morning. I pray for teaching grace, Lord, for the word's sake, that it might accomplish your will and it may go out and have the impact in the life of the hearer that you desire. I pray for the full leadership of the Holy Spirit today and every word that your word might be established and that it might be that which you uh, uh, prove. Father, I ask that you bless our pastor as well as he brings the message later on. We pray, Father, that you bless the work and ministry of this church, that you bless our request for prayer according to your will. We ask that you forgive us of our shortcomings and trespasses, Father, and we ask these favors and blessings now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, so we are going to be looking at verse 2, but because I know that this thing, um, this, this whole part of these lessons in these verses that we're doing, they are going to be tying together to some degree. So what I want to do is I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of, of recap, a small amount, just so we can kind of get up to speed on uh, what we're going to be looking at here this morning. So we're going to look at this morning a promise in verse 2. So we left off last week talking about Paul's calling, his perceived position, and I put that for a reason, because Paul had a, he had a perception of his position. Now, he was called an apostle, but there, this, this percept, perceived position is different than that, it, and you'll see in just a minute. And then also what his responsibility was. Well, his responsibility falls under that uh, line of apostleship and missionary work. So Paul said that he was, this is last week's lesson uh, recap, it said he was a servant. And we said that the, the word that was used there to translate servant is bond slave. So he, he, he literally saw himself as a bond slave to, to Jesus Christ. And I, I think we had pointed out as well that, that that's really the proper mindset. And I think if we can go into our labors and service with that mindset in our heart, that we'll find that we'll probably be more su uh, successful in, in the work and blessed, but we'll also be more genuine in our labor that we labor in. He was called, and this... Uh, this Greek word kletos is um, appointed. So he was appointed. And so verse 1 says this, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So he, he was appointed um, to be an apostle, to do the work of an apostle, and to labor uh, as one sent or a messenger. And, 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 and there was a special calling tied to that. So it was a very, um, it, I, I, you know, some people would say, well, it's very high. I'm not looking for that word. I'm looking for the word that describes uh, grave responsibility and, and, and a full um, essential outlining of things that he needed to accomplish for the Lord. So where much is given, much is expected. Um, so he's separated, called. He, so he was called to be an apostle, and he was separated um, specifically unto the gospel of Christ. And so this word, um, aferazzo, uh, to set off by boundary, limit, or divide. So he was literally separated to the gospel, and, and, the, and the boundaries of it were spreading the gospel message, that which pertained to the gospel message, and making sure that that got out. So it was, he was parceled out to, to that specific chunk of work. And interestingly enough, it didn't matter who the person was on the other on the receiving end. In fact, you'll find that he spent a lot of time with his countrymen when he would go into a new place. And then once they either kicked him out or accepted him, mostly kicked him out or ran him off or something, um, he even got he even got creative one time. He he set up an, an individual's house and he was catching people coming to and from the synagogue. And so he uh, he he was very um, active in fulfilling his calling to which he was appointed by the boundaries that were set off or, or the limit to which he was given. And I'm not saying that in a, in a negative sense. I'm saying it in a, in, a, 
in a positive sense. The limit that was given to him in a positive sense. So, uh, or that was, which was divided out. It was a lot. And, and so he, fo- he, he la- labored to fulfill it and he did so humbly. So he was separated to the gospel. And the gospel is, the, is a good message in this case. That's what the word translated means, a good message. And it is a good message. It's the great message. We have a Savior who paid the price on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And through him and his sacrifice, we can now have a relationship with God. That is great news. And so that's the good message. We'll learn more about that uh, you know, as we go through this. But um, So now specifically concerning the gospel mentioned in verse 1, Paul says this. Romans 1-2 which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So now let me read verse 1 and 2 together, because I think it's important to set the context. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel, which had been promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So the gospel or the good news, the coming of the Messiah, the sacrifice Messiah would make on behalf of the sins of the world, his resurrection. All of this was stuff that was spoken of concerning him in the prophets. And we'll get into some of that as well today in this lesson, and I hope you enjoy. Um, so now it's specific to the gospel, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You know, you can teach the gospel message in the Old Testament easily. <laughs> it's throughout. And so, and, and, and you know what? Jesus even declares that. He declares it in his own words. I got that in here. So, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 2 is referring to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that which Christ had well established in the Old Testament scriptures would come. Some believers, that, some believe that John the Baptist was the first to preach the gospel. That is not so. Um, as we've already pointed out, the gospel was proclaimed in the Old Testament prophets throughout the prophecies of Christ concerning his first advent or first coming. Um, Peter emphasized this when he declared it in Acts 10, 38 through 43. And this is what it says. It says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him, and we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So that is a very beautiful passage of scripture, but you can see that that whole ministry that's being talked about there, it says to, on, in verse 43, to him give all the prophets witness. So there's one declaration. You're going to hear more as we go through that, or through this. And we're, <laughs> I'll probably burn through and we'll end up getting done early. I don't know. Okay. This, it's not showing on the live again, so uh, we apologize for that. Um, I'll do more. Thank you for telling me because now I can describe at least a little bit more of what people aren't seeing. Okay. All right. So I got this picture that's popped up. It's really just like kind of a a cartoon uh, picture, but, you know, like maybe a painting or a drawing. And it has, you know, Joseph and Mary in the manger with baby Jesus and some, some of the animals around. And the reason that I have this up here is because of the passage of scriptures that I'm getting ready to read to you. Um, looks like it has the wise men in the background with the with the star of Jesus up in the sky, and and so it's a beautiful little picture and a back, backdrop there. But anyway, 
So two Old Testament examples. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So there's one passage of Scripture. Everyone's familiar with this one, and I love it because of its content. It says, For unto us a child is born. This is Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon, and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. <laughs> and that's what we're waiting for. And that's what we think is going to start <laughs> to be something we're going to see happening here pretty soon with the things that's going on in the world today. But if you look at that, you know what I like about this is the names. So if you look at the names, think about this. When people that, that argue the deity of Jesus Christ, which there's no argument if you read the Bible uh, concerning the deity of Jesus Christ, but listen to the names that are given him. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, <laughs> the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It makes reference to him sitting on the throne of David and ordering the kingdom. And, and, and the zeal of the Lord will perform this. I really like that whole, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. And I like that because it shows uh, a spirit or a character, a characteristic of God's disposition concerning this, de this day or time. That there's a great zeal. I, I happen to think, this is my conviction, that, that those that are in heavenly places right now, they're longing for this. Those that have gone on to be with the Lord already and, and in his presence, I think there's a great deal and amount of excitement with them and, and God himself with regards to this day that, that we're talking about here in Isaiah and how glorious it'll be when Jesus Christ returns in his second coming. The second coming of Jesus Christ. And so it's a very, uh, I, like, I like to read stuff like that and have, have the Holy Spirit kind of highlight it in my mind because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What a, what a powerful statement that is. So I got this other picture here. And this one is really kind of a scroll. And it's just showing a, a scroll with some uh, writing on it that looks ancient. And it's, you know, probably not ancient, but I mean, it's, it gives you the idea of maybe what a scroll that was uh, written on papyrus might have looked like back in the day or something close to it. But anyways, it's just used to kind of give you a visual of what we're trying to depict and what we're talking about. So this I'm about to read to you comes from the American Baptist Commentary. And... Um, well, I could say the American Baptist Association commentary and some of their literature. And so I, I, I like what's written, and so I'm carrying it over into this lesson. It says, while the rabbinical writings were most often emphasized in the first, first century by the Jews, Paul focused on the Holy Scriptures. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Paul's interest in and emphasize, in, um, emphasis on the Old Testament Scriptures is duly noted in the fact that he quotes from them some 72 times in Romans alone. Worthy of note was that Paul, Acts 28, 23, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 15, was not the only, was not only the first, was not the only first century Christian who saw the Old Testament as holy scriptures. Both Jesus and Luke concerned or concurred on this fact in Luke 24, 44, and John 1, 45 declared that Philip and Nathaniel did the same. So now I have those verses. I'm going to read them so I can validate what we're saying here. So I'm going to look, go back and look at Acts 28 to 23 here in just a second, 2 Timothy 3, 15, 
And I, I want you to note what we're looking at. What we're trying to prove here is uh, worthy of note was that Paul was not the only first century, uh, first century Christian who saw the Old Testament as holy scriptures. And then Jesus and Luke uh, concurred on this fact as well. And then also it was declared by Philip and Nathaniel in John 145. So here's the first one. Acts 28, 23. It says, and when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And like I said, we could do that too. I've, I've heard preachers give plenty of uh, messages concerning the gospel from the Old Testament. Because there, matter of fact, I'm just going to, like, I don't know if you all remember when we did the study on the Bible, which I didn't finish because it took so long to get it as far as we did, you know, some couple hundred slides worth of presentation, but we, did, we got all the way through the Old Testament. And when we were going and do the, the slides of the various books of the Old Testament, you start to see in the minor uh, uh, prophets, you start to see them all start to make reference to the day of the Lord. And, and you see the things that are said about them there. Then you see what, what is said about, um, those times from Daniel, what Ezekiel might have to say on the subject, or what we've already looked at some of what uh, Isaiah um, has had to say on the subject. And then you can go back and you can see in the e even further back when you start talking about uh, Melchizedek, the king, and what he represents. You can look in there and see one of the most fasc fascinating studies I ever did in the Old Testament. And it just, I wasn't going there on my, because I thought, I knew what I needed to know about it. It just happened while I was studying the subject for other reasons, is the types that are seen of Jesus in the life of Joseph. If you go and you, now this is something you might want to do because it's worth it. If you go and start looking up how many types Joseph represents in, in, of the reality of Christ, meaning that jo Joseph wasn't Christ, but what happened to him in life and, and the things that he represented and how he did and ordered his life, you would see that there's a lot of types. What types are, is they're like a shadow of, of the true. Um, and so they're not the true. They're just like a, a type, a, a shadow showing something uh, that's going to be a greater truth, right? Um, <laughs> it makes me think of this. Okay, I got to stop for a second. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm all serious now, but I got this little thing I saw. And I'm sitting there thinking of this type and the shadow, and I I saw this uh, little reel on Instagram, and this kid, this this guy was, he was proposing to this woman. Maybe some of you saw it. And this kid started to walk into the proposal while it was being filmed, and some some woman just came, grabbed by the arm, and snatched him back to where he, it happened so fast. Kid probably had whiplash. The reason it made me think of his shadow, they said someone in the comments said they pulled him back so fast they let his shadow still there. <laughs> You know, so there was a lot of those kind of comments, which was hilarious. But, um, you know, they, they pulled him back so fast, his shadow didn't even get a chance to catch up. It's still standing there. But um, anyway, so you see in the life of Joseph a lot of types of Jesus. I think there's something like 22 of them, 21 to 22. And that's the, the scriptures testifying and declaring a great truth that Jesus would come and that he would fulfill these things. In fact, he makes reference to that. So that's, that's all the scriptures must be fulfilled. Everything that was said about him back then needed to be fulfilled to validate his messiahship. You know, in other words, to show that it was true what was said. God is going to fulfill what he said he was going to do in Christ Jesus. Here's the other one. 2 Timothy 3.15. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto the salvation, unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So here's the reference where he refers to them as holy scriptures. Now keep in mind, there's, uh, um, the, I'd say there's a large part of the, of the New Testament that wasn't existing at the time. Paul was making reference here largely to the holy scriptures, most of which were likely, um, the Old Testament scriptures. And I'm telling you, Paul had a very commanding knowledge of those scriptures, right? He, 
That's why, you know, when, when I talk about Hebrews, and I mentioned that, and I've mentioned it a million times, that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sold on him being the author of Hebrews just because of the ability he would have had in, in his own education to make that argument so, so, so successfully and so thoroughly. And so he had a, a great understanding of these scriptures. So when he's writing to young Timothy here and preparing him as a, as a pastor, he says, and that, and, that, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I didn't even think about something I just got just now. And, and, and that is, you have known the Holy Scriptures from a child, which means he's definitely likely talking solely about the Old Testament. And in and, 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 and such a case, he's saying, they're able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So there's another example of the point we're trying to make here. Here's another one, Luke 22:44. It says, and this is a very powerful statement on Jesus' part. He says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Okay, so that's what we just mentioned earlier. They have to be fulfilled because they, they're, they're essentially validating his uh, lordship, his uh, messiahship. And so he's fulfilling these things that were written, everything that was written about them, about him, he's fulfilling. So he, it, it's a part of saying, hey, I am the messiah. These things that were said, I've fulfilled. I've done this. And not only that, it pleased the father. It pleased the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, it said. And so the, the sacrifice that Jesus would make on the cross, because of all these things he fulfilled and did, and, I, and, I, and, and again, when you talk about Christ being a bond slave, and then you look at Jesus Christ, essentially you could say that he was a bond slave to the Father's will. Because everything that he did, all, and, and everything he said, he said, I just say what my father tells me to say. I do what my father tells me to do. And so Paul, if anything, he's lined himself with the mindset of Jesus Christ and his attitude and disposition. And as a result of that, he was successful in his ministry, even though he suffered greatly. But Jesus suffered greatly as well, you know. But it, 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 whenever uh, it came to that point where he was ready to be nailed to that tree, there was nothing, there was no sin in him. He had fulfilled everything that was said about him. He had said every word his father wanted him to say. He had accomplished every purpose. And when he was nailed to that tree, he was, it was so glorious in the, in the eyes of the Godhead that it was easily well enough to pay the government of God's requirement for the sin trespass. And that's why when we are forgiven, we are forgiving, we are being forgiven holy because the sacrifice is accepted holy. For those people that think you have to uh, repent all the time or do all this work to stay saved, you're, you've missed the whole purpose of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's, it's complete. He said it was finished. All right? Um, he's paid for every sin that we've asked forgiveness for, even though there's some we haven't for, we haven't committed yet. Uh, I'm gonna probably commit some today. I'm sorry, I have allergies, <laughs> and my nose is itching, and it does that from time to time. So, um, I'm, I'm not up, I'm not up here picking it. So, <laughs> it just got a little itch going to it. Okay, here's the next one, and the final one. Luke 1:45. It says, Philip findeth Nathaniel, and saith unto him. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What did I say? John. Okay, well, John 145. If I said Luke, I apologize. Um, so, yeah, John 145. But, but notice, what, notice what Philip, he findeth Nathaniel and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 
So they're identifying him as the, you know, basically the Messiah. And, and it was because, because they were able to identify him based on what was written in the, in the law and the prophets. And so that, that was the identifying mark. Him fulfilling these things was validating to them that he is the one called. And so I brought this picture in right here. And what it is, it's really a picture of it, what, it's, what it's trying to display is the resurrected Lord. So he's, he's bright and he, his garments are bright and he's radiating, you know, a certain um, righteousness, essentially, as we could depict it in a movie. And so we're, we got that, obviously, because we're going to be talking about some things along that line. So um, the sun... Verse 3. Now, this verse is associated with what is said in verse 1 with regard to the gospel. So I'm going to go back and read uh, all three of these verses, even though it's good. I'm going to show you verse 3 later, but it says this. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So there's two statements that are really kind of being made there with regards to Jesus. Um, concerning the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, so God the Son, right? But also made of a seed of David according to the flesh. So the important thing that we've, we've tried to drive home here in our teaching is the, the basic simple truth which some in the world deny um, and some faiths in the world deny that Jesus Christ was all flesh and Jesus Christ was also all God. He was a God flesh. There's never been anybody like him, nor will there ever be any, anybody like him again. He's a singular, one of a kind. He is, he is godly flesh. That's hard to even fathom. That's why they couldn't take his life. If, if Jesus wasn't crucified and he was choosing to, had a will to, he'd be walking the earth today. But that wasn't his purpose. His purpose wasn't to live and walk in this earth as God and flesh. His purpose was to be all man, but perfect, so that he could, he could offer himself up for the sins of the world and then raised from the dead because death had no claim on him, securing victory for us over sin, death, and the grave. And to that, we praise God today. So, this verse is associated with what is said in verse 1 with the word gospel. The gospel of God concerning his son. The design of the gospel was to make a communication. That's the design, to make a communication. In this case, relative to God's son, Jesus. And that was the whole of it. Just to make a communication relative to God's son, Jesus Christ. And that was the whole purpose of it. Okay? And then life, death, and resurrection, and ascension of God the son. There, are, uh, there is no good news to man uh, respecting salvation except that which comes by and through Jesus Christ. There is no good news uh, that is regarding salvation except that which comes through Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way that God is going to recognize our pardon is if it's in the blood of Jesus Christ, if it's under that sacrifice. One drop of that blood can save every person in the world that's ever lived, is living, and will live. What a price. What a valuable price. This little picture I brought up, it's a little waterfall cute little thing. They like to put verses in waterfalls and in little landscapes. That's why you see them sometimes. But this is 2 Timothy 2.8. It says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead 
according to my gospel. And so, you know, Jesus being raised from the dead uh, is, it was a necessary thing. And I love the way he, he is about it. I have power to lay my life down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment I have received from my father. So, you know, in, in I think it's chapter two of the book of Acts when Peter's preaching and he was talking about uh, Christ going into the grave and death literally had no claim on him. Can you imagine that death has a claim on us? It's appointed unto man once to die, but it had no claim on Jesus because there was no sin. So when he, when he chose, that's why you know he absolutely get, laid it down. He gave it up. They couldn't, I mean, I, I can't even imagine. Every time I say that, my mind goes right, it just goes like lightning quick right to him being scourged. And I, I mentioned this, I've mentioned this many times. I can't help it. Um, but I picture him getting scourged and them just trying and he can't bleed out. He can't die. They can't kill him. Where I'd be like, uh-uh. <laughs> I'd be done. I'd be out. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know, I'd be screaming and hollering and, and crying. And, and then when the blood left my body, it, the life would leave with it. But not Jesus. No. He was God in the flesh. Romans 1, 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. So now you have these two parts we're going to look at. Which was made. You see, you got the, the first part, son of, of Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. So which was made, the word translated was made means usually to become uh, or to be. I got those switched around. But uh, it is used here in the sense of to become or being born. So uh, was made of or being born of in lineage, the seed of David, his lineage line. And that's pretty well map mapped out in the scriptures for us as far as that lineage. We'll talk about it here in just a second. Um, Galatians 4.4 4 says this, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Yes. When, the, when it tells us in Luke that the spirit of God over, overshadowed her um, and she was found with child. In other words, she placed God's seed. That's something also just really kind of, it messes with my mind to try to conceive what that must have been like for Mary, how that, that experience must have, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, a perfect baby, a perfect baby. Now we get, we think they're all perfect when they come out and they are, they're close. They're close as they're ever going to get to it. But you watch those little rascals and they start to get bigger and you can see the, the nature just creep in and start to take over and the smiles. Oh, they use those smiles against us. Yeah. Yeah. They use a little cute head turns. But Grammy, but Grammy, but Grammy, you know, but you can see them sneaking the little crackers, you know, that they're not supposed to be getting into, right? We see all that because they're starting to develop that sin nature. It blows my mind to think about what it must have been like raising Jesus or, or even giving birth and the, and the things associated with all that. And so everything pertained to his perfection and, and his growing up. In flesh. You imagine he was presenting himself in eternity. Philippians tells us chapter two that he, he had, he didn't think it was robbery to be expressing himself in his godly form with all righteousness, but he didn't see the ability to do that and the desire and the will to do it as something to be clutched at to the degree that he would not humble himself to take on the form of a man and suffer the death on the cross of Calvary, even the worst possible death, right? But um, we see all this righteousness of Jesus Christ and the expression of it, yet he comes to this earth for 33 years in the form of a man and even says something to the effect of the son of man hath not a place to lay his head. You know, didn't live the easiest life. 
33 and a half years is a long time to us. And Jesus was experiencing it, I believe, on the same level we do because he was human. But God, so it's just, those are the things my brain just floats away with when I start reading some of this stuff and it starts to settle on me a little bit. So now it can settle on you a little bit and hopefully get your mind all, you know, whoo, whatever that means. Um, John 5, 58, it says, before Abraham was, I am. And it really is saying, before Abraham was born, I am. Um, in this sense, the word is used here referring to the one who was born or descended from the seed of David, of which Mary was the lawful and true descendant. And you can read about that in Luke 3, 23 through 38. And I'm going to make a point here because when you go read that, you're going to say it looks like it's Joseph, but uh, it looks like it's Joseph lineage, but it's, it's not. Traditionally, it would have been proper to refer to the son-in-law of a married couple. But in fact, the lineage you see in Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 38 is Mary's lineage from David. And the lineage you see in Matthew 1, 16 is Joseph is recorded in Joseph's father as being Jacob. So you can see that he was the son-in-law of Heli, um, and, and that's Mary's lineage. And so anyways, I wanted to point that out because you have to kind of study a little bit to understand how things were written and why they were written the way they were. But you can see essentially both individuals had lineage from David, even though Joseph would not, um, not contribute anything to the birth of Jesus Christ or the seed or anything like that, obviously, because he was a simple man, yet he was still of the same lineage or of the lineage of David like Mary was. And so the scriptures are fulfilled with that, or at least that portion of them anyways. Um, the son, Jesus Christ, is the second person in the triune Godhead. Not everyone believes in a triune Godhead. We do. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. And we believe these, are, these three are one. Um, and that is a hard thing for me to understand as well. I thought when I was a dumb kid that I could understand it pretty good. But like you are three in one. You have your spirit, you have your soul, and you have your body. And so uh, it's very similar to that. And that's about as close as my dumb mind can get to uh, putting it into a perspective I can understand. So the title, His Son, Jesus Christ, Our Lord, denotes the divine feature of the sonship of Christ, while the human side of Christ is addressed in the last part of the verse. Oops, so, so Jesus Christ was the Son of God before he became the Son of Man. He has really been eternal. He's been before the world was even formed, before the foundations were even laid. Jesus was. And so we see that in the scriptures as well. We know of his divinity and his eternal eternality. If that's if I can say it that way. Um, in fact, he is the eternal son who was directly involved in the original creation of the, uh, the universe and of mankind as well. Um, and I'm going to read John 1, 1 through 4 in a second. I got another verse I'm going to dump in right back, right behind that one because I love it so much and I didn't want to leave it out. So there, you're going to get a bonus verse just because I'm feeling generous today. <laughs> okay, as the son of God, he is also the heir of all that God is and all that he has. So I got this picture. This is really one I wish I could have shared. Um, the illustrator of this picture, I thought it was pretty cool, but he's, he's showing what would look like Jesus in a robe, and he's got his hands out like this, and he's in the middle of what like, looks like a Milky Way galaxy. And, and, and it's, it's describing him as the picture's conveying Jesus creating. And he's just in there in the middle of the mixed Milky Way galaxy as he's forming things out of it into uh, whether they be planets or stars. He's forming these things and he's, he's, um, he's ordering it. And I just, I thought it was cool. Uh, it was probably a lot more spectacular than that by, by billions and trillions. 
but nevertheless, um, you know, it, it, it does help to see something that kind of inspires the mind to think on a greater scale. Okay, so here's those verses. Uh, no, this is where we're going. Okay. John 1, 1 through 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, I was kind of messing that up a little bit because my mind was thinking about something I wanted to tell you right now. And that is it, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The definite article occurs. So what it would be more, it would be more along the lines of something like this with the definite article. In the beginning was the word, meaning it was, it was the word, not just the word, but the word, meaning it's, there's a uh, emphasis on who he was and the word was him. Okay. And the word was with God. This, the word, the one that is him, the one is with God. And this same, this same word was God. So that definite article magnifies what's being said here to establish the deity of Jesus Christ. So the same was in the beginning with God, meaning the same word, the word was in the beginning with God, the same one that we're talking about here. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And you know what's so spectacular about this passage of scripture? Is that it's followed by this one. John 1, 14. And that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Ah, oh, I love that. And that word, the word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And look what he says. And we be beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when you talk about when you talk about the word full here with regard to the word, the one, it's the again, it gets elevated. So when you're saying full, it's saying complete, complete. There is absolutely nothing lacking. There's no more that can be added to it. It's complete. And what was complete in him? Grace and truth. That's not the only thing, but in this passage of scripture, that's what's being conveyed. There's a lot of things that was complete in him. Love was complete in him. You see that on the cross of Calvary. To, to, to have to experience, I think probably the worst thing, I can't even say that because he got beat good. Um, one of the things that was definitely perhaps the most grievous thing he had to endure was that moment when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That moment when he felt our sin, the weight of our sin and the impact it had when the father looked at him bearing our sin and the separation that he felt as a result of that. Ah, hard stuff. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to close now with these things. The seed, verse 3, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Uh, humanly speaking, Jesus Christ is made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The, the difference, um, or the reference to the seed of David reminds us of the Davidic covenant and the divine purpose or promise that Jesus Christ will reign over all the earth from Jerusalem. Now, a lot of people may not like arbitrarily just not, they may not know what it means when I say the Davidic covenant. So I wanted to explain it to you and I wanted to do it as cleanly as possible in an effort to do so. And I happened to be searching and I got this place, I got to this site called Got Questions. And I thought, All right, I'll just go in there. Well, they had one of the best ones. So I'm going to reference Got Questions on the answer to the Davidic covenant. This is what they wrote. 
The Davidic covenant refers to God's promise to David through Nathan, the prophet, and is found in 2 Samuel uh, 7 and later summarized in 1 Chronicles 17, 1 through 14 and 2 Chronicles 16, 6. This is an unconditional covenant made between God and David through which God promised David and Israel that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come from the lineage of David and the tribe of Judah and would establish a kingdom that would endure forever. The Davidic covenant is unconditional because God does not place any conditions of obedience upon its fulfillment. The surety of the promises made rests solely on God's faithfulness and does not depend at all on David or Israel's obedience. What they're saying by that is that God is sovereign, and he'll fulfill it because he declared he would. And so we can find that a lot of things, we are not obedient, but God can make, he can still bring, bring about his will in our life because he's sovereign. Our, our choices don't impact his ability to do what he says he's going to do and do what he wants to do for that matter. So here's some of those passages of scripture that were referenced there, and then we're going to close. So it says in, in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13, it says, and when, they, and, and when thy days shall be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Speaking of Jesus Christ. There's a sermon right there. <laughs> I'm just saying, there's a sermon right there, just right there. Okay, um, Luke 1, 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Praise God. Uh, the members of the church in Rome, uh, and most people, I understand the letter is written to, um, to all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Um most people believe that, that it was a church assembled there, and that's who he was most likely ad uh, addressing to. So, um, but feel free to look up that one up for yourself. The members of the church in Rome, along with everyone else in the Roman Empire, lived under the authoritarian rule, authorita authoritarian rule of the Caesars. I had to let my brain connect to my tongue for a second there. It was on a reboot, kind of like our computer system. Um, <laughs> we got her done all right christians often were especially targeted for harassment and persecution by authorities we see that you, you can go see some of the own Rome, roman writings and you can see the persecution i brought some of those actual documents not the real ones of course but copies of them onto the screen and, and, and into this class concerning uh christianity in the early days and the persecution they felt oftentimes and harassment they felt oftentimes by the Romans. Um, the time will come, however, when Christ the King will have a benevolent and enduring reign of genuine peace and justice for all people. And that is what we long for. I want to be in that kingdom. I want to be uh, there when I want to be, when he, I want to be with him when he turns. I want, I, hey, my, my grandma, like I told you, she's always, always praying to live to see the resurrection. By the time she got to be 92, I was like, it's coming. <laughs> she, she might make it, you know. But uh, I would, I'd love to be alive at the resurrection, uh, I think. I don't know. Whatever, whatever, whatever the Lord's will is, it would be great if it was right now. Like right now. You're in church, you're praising God, you're feeling the spirit moving in you, boom. Wouldn't that be great? But see, somewhere it's, it's three hours ahead of us and they're already out of church. So, you know, how does that work? I don't know. But it's something to, it's something to, to take pleasure in thinking about. But one day, one day we'll be in the presence of the Lord, ruling and reigning with him in that kingdom where we've learned about a little bit here this morning. All right? We're going to close in a word of prayer. Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm a little bit on the delay system myself. It's good to have each and every one of you here with us this morning. We're going to be uh, page 61 in the blue book. And while you're turning there, I'd really like to get the elephant out of the closet before I actually get started. I do understand 
that I do not match this morning. Okay? I, I've been informed. My wife does not want to take responsibility for it. She said it's my fault. I should have asked if I if I match. Gray does not go with brown. Uh, I like it for a change up. So, you know, if you if you can get past, you know, if, and if it just bothers you so much, close your eyes. And I, I'll, I'll just think that you're praying. Okay? So, we'll, we'll, well, just pray for me. Pray for me that the Lord will give me a better color combination sense. Yes. It does match the beard, as I was just told. That tied it all in. All right. Page number 61. Let's honor and glorify God this morning. As we journey on toward heaven's shiny goal, we may suffer pain and loss. Burdens only bring us blessings if we live in the shadow of the cross. Are you living in the shadow of the cross where the Savior took your place by the cross will lead us to that home above there we'll see him face to face on the tree of sorrow Jesus Jesus died for all, took upon himself our dross. As I see him there, I long to ever live in the shadow of the cross. Are you living in the shadow of the cross where the Savior took your place? By the cross will lead us to that home above. There we'll see him face to face. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. On the sea of life they toss. May we be a light and teach them how to live in the shadow of the cross. Are you living in the shadow of the cross where the Savior took your place? By the cross he'll lead us to that home above. There we'll see him face to face. What a glorious day, the day in which we shall see him face to face. Page number 28. Page number 28. Bringing in the sheaves. <clears throat> sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy eve, waiting for the harvest, and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. 
Sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Going forth with weeping, sowing for the master, though the loss sustained our spirits often grieve. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. You know, sitting here thinking that when I was a younger man, I think I could have hit most of those notes. What has happened? Uh, the older I get, I think the less notes. I'm going to be down to like two notes. Two notes and gray pants. That'll be my lot in life. Page number one, higher ground. Page number one. <clears throat> I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward Bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Verse number four. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. <clears throat> All right, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be going to 2 Corinthians this morning, 2 Corinthians 10th chapter. And one of the oddest things, uh, and it's not so odd because it happens all the time, but I say odd. And the, the reason why is there's a term that is, that is used 
within, um, there, there is a term that is used in the scriptures that many times we, we don't even talk about it. We don't think about it. It's just, I've never really, pressed, I don't think, preached a sermon about it. But Brother Scott actually used the term in his lesson, and it's really what the, the message is all about. And that is boundaries. Boundaries. I don't think we think about boundaries too often. Uh, we might, with inside of our own household, think about boundaries that, you know, you could go so far with this or go so far with that, knowing that maybe sarcasm can only go so far. We only take it that far, so we, we try to reel it back. Uh, the, when, when food is placed upon the table, and depending upon how many people you actually are going to have eat, eating that meal at that time, you, you, you figure out how you're going to divvy that out, right? Boundaries. Because if you, if you eat more than what is your allotted share, you might be in trouble. And, and so I, I, I look at this and I, and I thought of, about the Apostle Paul and how it was that he had what was considered boundaries, Right? That there was a, a there was a consideration that he would only go so far in preaching the gospel message. It, it it also then would state that there that those who who also would go out into uh, the ministry preaching the gospel that they would also only go so far. And it makes you wonder why, because in in all of it you would think that the world is is our our free course. That wherever we might find ourselves to be, wherever it is that we would go, that the gospel needs to be preached. People need to hear about the Lord. And so it, it shouldn't matter then to where it is that, that, that we find ourselves going, but rather it, it should matter what we're doing with it. You know, that, that at any given moment of time, we should be ready willing and able to preach the gospel. So understand that that's kind of the sense of it, yet at the same time I think there's a lot more to what Paul was saying in, in all of this. So in 2 Corinthians the 10th chapter beginning in verse 14 we read For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in the preaching of the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but uh, having hope when your faith is increased that ye shall be enlarged by, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospel in the region beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things, made ready to, to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commended. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence, thanking you for the time that you have given un, unto us to be here today. We thank you for your word that has already gone out for the uh, classes that have been taught. We thank you for the teachers that, that faithfully stand in front of their classes and, and teach your word. Father, we also are grateful this morning for you being here with us and watching over us and guiding us and, and opening up our hearts and our minds that, that we might receive from you what is needful for our lives. Father, we live in a, a, in a wicked and a cruel world, a world that many times does not understand the difference between right and wrong, good and bad. So, Father, today, as we open your word, bring us to your good and help us to understand those things that are right. So, Father, that we might do those things, that we, we might not be caught up in doing the, 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 the wrong and the evil things of life, but, Father, that we might allow you to work through us so that your goodness might be seen in the world in which we live. I thank you, Lord, for loving me. I thank you for being as compassionate upon me as, as you are. And, Father, for, for just 
directing our paths in the places in which you would have to go. Sometimes, Father, it is, it's hard. Sometimes we, we might want to give up and we might want to quit. We might just want to throw in the towel. But, Father, we do not want to do that. We want to be faithful. We want, we want to, to honor and glorify your holy name, to live a life that would be pleasing in your sight. Father, we desire that as, as long as we live here, that we might see lost souls saved and, and people come to a place in their lives where they want to follow you. I just thank you for, for loving me again and watching over me and help me that I might present your word in a way which be pleased in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I titled the message, God Approved, and, 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 and it really has everything to do with that. It has everything to do with the fact that wherever I, I might find myself, I want to be found in a place where God has brought me to. I want to be found doing the things in which God desires for me to do. I want to, I want to be the type of person that God can count on to, to call and, and to say, this is where... I, I want you for today. That, I don't have to, to, to work so much in the, 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 the long-lasting, you know what I'm saying? Because sometimes I think we, we set, we've set our, our, our position where we're at, and, and we, we think of that in, in long terms, you know, that I'm not really seeing myself as ever moving away from this, this is my job. This is what I do. This is, you know, and it, it can be that way with any one of us. That that maybe you have a, a life that you live right now that you're pretty comfortable with, and, and you know your routine. You you wake up in the morning and 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 you do your thing until until the night comes and you you can get some rest, and then in the next day you do it all over again. And, and we just we we count on that being the way that our life our life is. Now take the Apostle Paul for a second, who we'll, we'll, we'll just categorize him as, as a, a, a missionary, right? That's what we'll say that he is. And in many of the other things that he did, such as uh, being a tent maker, he did in order to support the fact that he was a, a missionary. So his life was lived with that purpose in mind. And there might be some, th some changes that took place along the way. But for the most part, Paul lived his life that he might present the gospel of Christ to a lost and dying world. That's what he desired to do. That was his job. That was his calling. That would be what God approved of. Okay? So God approved. It says in our scripture reading what the Apostle Paul would say, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure. And so they did not go further than what they believed God wanted them to do. And we can see this easily with inside the scriptures when, when the Apostle Paul came to a place where he was pretty much done with Asia Minor and wanted to go on up into Asia to present the gospel. But he was prohibited in doing such. God, God did not permit him to do that very thing. And after a little bit of time passed and a, and a, and a vision in which he saw, Paul realized where God wanted him was over in Macedonia. You see, that was what God approved. That's what... That's where God said, this is where I want you. This is where, where God said, okay, go this, this direction and I'll be with you. Now, and it's not to say that, that God would not be with them wherever he went. What it is to say is that God had a plan. And in this plan, he would direct Paul to go in the direction that he wanted him to go. So that he could do what God wanted him to do. He had finished in this area, but God wanted him over now in this area in order to present the gospel to these people. Did it mean that, 
that this er other area that he wanted to go to would not be be taken care of? No. It just meant that God wanted him here where he might have somebody else over here. The, the, the work of God is not as simplistic as many times as we want, want, it to, want to see it as, is what I'm trying to tell you. Sometimes that God is working, we have no idea, but God is working. And, and he is moving in areas that we can't see until some of the results begin to take place in those very areas. That God is at work doing things that, that are beyond us because God can do what God can do sometimes better if we're not in the mix of that. God working. God stretching out his measure for the apostle and, 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 and saying, I don't want you to go beyond this. And somebody would think that, that that was strange. Why, why not send Paul everywhere? I mean, he was very effective in what it was that he had done. He could be just as effective in Galatia as he was in Ephesus. He could be just as effective in Ephesus as, as say he was in Corinth very effective because of, of, of the goal or, or the, the, of the abilities in which we have or what she had in growing up and learning the things that he had learned along the way. But here's the deal. The Apostle Paul was effective because God was with him. God was with him because God moved him to the places he wanted him to go. And, and in going where God wanted him to go, he was, he was approving what God had approved for him to do. And so the, 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 the complexity of it is, is that it really has very little, and, and I'm going to get more into this, little to do with our abilities as much as it has to do with God's desire. And if, and if you're hearing the message and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, God's desire for you is to come to a place where you would accept Jesus as your personal Savior. That's God's desire. God approves of that. See, we, we live in a world that has to be very dis, uh, disappointing to our Maker. The way that it... It is going the way that it has turned out. Yes, he knew it was going to happen. Yes, he foresaw it all along the way. Yes, he told his prophets to write it down so that we might see it. But how how dis disapproving it must be for him to see the way that it has gone. It goes to prove that man on his own will, will always fail. He'll, he'll, he'll always, you know, come up to, to problems and, 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 and things which he has to deal with that he can, can accomplish. But man with God will be successful. That it, it may sometimes seem like we're, we're just beating our heads against the wall. But I, I really believe that, that God is in the mix of it all. And God is the one who is who's bringing us this far. Just as I can say, God has brought Paul that far. That, that he, he didn't get there by mistake. He got there because God's hand was in it. And God was moving him to where God wanted him to be. He said unto the church at Corinth, he says, For we are come as far as to you. And I think that's such a beautiful sentiment. And, 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 and it's, sometimes it's, it's hard for me to, to, to put it into words just how I feel about those words themselves. That here's the church at Corinth. Now, it wasn't where Paul wanted to go. And, and where, where, where Paul wanted to go was like a totally opposite direction. And yet God said, but this is where I want you. And so in obedience to the call of God, 
Paul went to where where it was that God was directing him. And Paul could say, we, we, we've carried along with this, this gospel message. Now, you know, others might see things that would be more important. Let's, let's, let's take it this way. I, I've, I've come as far as to you with this bag of gold. Right? And, and, and this is where I've been, been, been led to. This is where, where I, I was to come, was to bring to you this bag of gold. How, how exciting would that be to us? You know, that, that, that God somewhere down the line thought about us and said to us, I'm going to send unto you this most precious thing, this bag of gold, and it's, it's yours for the, for the having. If, if you will have it, it's yours. But instead of a bag of gold, he says, I, I send unto you this gospel message. And I, it is gone at this point. There's God writing in and pinning in somebody's name. Say, Paul, here, Corinth. Okay. And then, then, then he'll go to another one and he'll pin somebody else's name in. He says, you know, I, I want this person to go to this place. And so God is at the helm. And he's, he's designing a, a perfect, uh, if you will, missionary endeavor to the world that still is at need because the world has not yet heard. And I've come as far as to you. Paul had a lot to deal with in that he had people coming around uh, and, and they began to, to work in the areas that he had worked on. He, what, we, what we fail sometimes to see with the Apostle Paul is, is the, the, the way that he went. Because he went into the areas of, of uh, Asia Minor. And he preached the gospel there. And there's churches that were set up. He went back to Jerusalem to, to speak of what it was that he had done unto uh, the apostles or the rest of the apostles and the council that had gathered that day. Uh, and, and, and so he presented the work to them. Right? Then he went back out again. And he went back through the churches that he had organized at, at, at the first so that he could deal with any problems that might have come up during that period of time that he was gone away. Because there were people coming in preaching another gospel at the time that he wasn't there. And so he was reaffirming the truth to those who, who might would hear. And this was the direction that the Lord had given unto him. In Acts, the 18th chapter, verse 8, the scripture says this. It says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians uh, hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in, in the night by a vision, and he said, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on, on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. A year and a half, Paul stayed at, with the Corinthians, just building them up instructing them in the word, helping them to understand, being a practical uh, witness before them of how it was to be a child of God. You see, he stayed there to, to show unto them what it was, but this wasn't Paul. Once again, if we back up a second, what we see is this was the Lord. Paul was just following what the Lord told him to do doing the things that, that the Lord wanted him to perform, staying in a place as long as he did because the Lord directed him to do that very thing. If we could take it away 
from people just for a moment and place it back into the hands of God and see that this is what God desired. This is what God wants. You know, maybe my, my, my whole point is, and this, this comes to me, so don't, don't, uh, don't take it personal. If it, if it, if it hurts a little, I'm going to say it to, about myself. Maybe the point is, is God saying to me, it's time for you to start letting me do the work. It's time for you to start listening to what I have to say. It's, ta- it's time for you to follow in the direction that I am leading you. Rather than, you know, sitting down and deciding for myself which way I should go. In 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 12, it says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number uh, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but, uh, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Let me read that one more time because it's actually really good stuff. So he says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number uh, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. When we start giving ourselves all the pats on the back for the things that are done, we're not very smart. Because if we want the power of God to truly be unleashed, then we need to put God back in his rightful place as being the head of the church. He is the head. I am not the head. Jesus is the good shepherd. I am not the good shepherd. I am but an under shepherd. It's, It's time for us to put God back in his rightful place and and allow him to work what only he can do we want conviction that we need the spirit of god in this place do you understand what i'm saying to you that the conviction that 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 is effectual in, in our lives that comes from god's word is one which comes by the power of the holy spirit within inside of our lives that the Spirit moves and the Spirit guides, the Spirit convicts, the Spirit is the very very one that brought me from that pew to this altar to accept Jesus as my Savior. It wasn't me. It wasn't the pastor. I can't even tell you what the message was. (laughs) How many of you remember the message that was preached the day that you were saved? But I'm going to say that it was of God. And it was not of us, it was not of the pastor who preached the message, nor the message itself, but it was the Spirit that took the message and convicted us of our need. And we were just obedient to accept it. The boundaries. The boundaries. Paul said it's... it's, for me to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. And I, again, when you begin to map it out, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was sitting there thinking, if I had a green screen, I want to be a weather person so bad, if I had a green screen, right? And I, and I had all of Asia Minor sitting up there. I had Antioch over here. I had Jerusalem down there. And I, I could point to and I said, here's where Paul went. He started here in Antioch. Actually, Paul, if you get down to it, he was up in uh, uh, Damascus. That's where he was. Some people went and got him, brought him back down. But anyhow, here, I'm on my green screen. And I said, I tell you, they're right here in Antioch. That's where the Apostle Paul started. And what was, this, what was the statement? The Lord, the Lord said unto the church at, at Antioch, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas, right? I want you to give them to me. No longer will they be yours on your membership. Matter of fact, you take out your, your, your pins and cross them out. They're no longer yours. They're mine. And I'm going to send them. And he sent them unto Crete, right? So now we're pointing a little bit further to Crete. Then they crossed over into Galatia. 
and preach to the Galatian churches. And, and so we can map out Paul's thing, but what we, what we would miss if we're not careful is that in all of this, the Lord is the one who directed his path. It was, not, it was not Paul deciding one day and go back to Antioch where the Lord said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas because that's what happened and that's the way it was all the way down through. That, that God desired for this thing to be and God's will was performed. It was God approved. Man, that's what I want to hear said on, on my life and on my ministry, that the ministry itself that, that, I, that I've been entered into is God-approved. That God is the one who's behind it. That God is the one who's directed it. Romans 15, verse 23. I know I'm a little bit behind. At, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I won't be sorry. Romans 15, 23. But now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, when, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey and be brought on my way thith thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Paul's desire was to go to Rome. Paul's desire was to go to, to, to Spain. He never made it to Spain. And he made it to Rome in, in shackles. He got there. He just got there the hard way. You see, what God approved of was how, how Paul entered in, in, into getting to the place where he desired him to be. That's what God approved of. All Paul had, he said, I want to come to you. I desire, man, there's a lot of places I'd like to go. You know, when I first was in the ministry, I thought, I thought that I would go to Maine. You know why? Because there's no churches in Maine. There's none of our kind of churches, preach the things that we preach, none in Maine. I didn't think too much about what, what it meant to live in Maine, though. <laughs> it's, it's awfully cold. I don't know if anybody knows that. It's, it's pretty much a fisherman's place. If you're, if you're not a fisherman, you've probably got no labor whatsoever. Uh, it had been, been a tough, 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 tough road. That doesn't mean that somebody shouldn't do it. <laughs> I'm voting for the next guy. I'm just saying that... Sometimes our wishes don't always match up with God's wishes, God's desires. It's, but eventually God brings us to a place to where his will for our lives match up. Paul's desire to go to Rome was, was a good desire. He just he got there in, in, a, in, in a different way. But you know, we got there so that he might be able to present the word of God. And God made it possible for Paul to receive visitors while in prison so that the gospel could be heard and the gospel could, could be accepted. This is what, what Brother Scott's teaching on, on Sunday mornings now. Teaching of what Paul was able to do in writing unto the church of, of, at Rome. He got there. By the will of God, he got there. But the, it wasn't for, it wasn't because of himself, but because God wanted his message to be presented in a place where few would go. Because you know what he had to face when he got to Rome, right? Right? Emperor worship. Well, and we're not, we're, that's, that's where, where I might then lead into the idea and, and the understanding that they were, they were very carnal in Rome. But they were carnal in Rome because their God was the emperor. And God had a voice in Rome. And that voice was Paul's. 
because it was God who directed his path. Lastly, if you look to the book of Jeremiah in the ninth chapter, the scripture says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in, uh, in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 31, he said that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let God receive all honor and glory. Our, the breath that we take, we take because God allows us to. The places that we are able to go, because God allows us to. The things that we are able to enjoy, Praise God, He allows us to. This morning, whatever your need might be, know that God will meet your need because that's the promise that He's made. That He, he, will, he will guide us, He will protect us, He will provide for us. But most of all, He will never leave us nor forsake us. Let God have His way in your life today. If you need to come to a, and accept Jesus as your Savior, Today is a good day. Accept Him now while, it's, while you have the opportunity. And if you, there's something you need to do in your, in your life, maybe you need to ask for forgiveness for this or forgiveness for that. Maybe you, you just there's some things that you just need to take care of. This is a good place to take care of it. Come. Let me pray with you. Let us reason together with the Lord as we pray. Jesus knows our every move. 